We're getting close to the end. This is the review leading up to the final examination. You will all have accessed or hopefully accessed a copy of the exam off eLearn and already tried to do it. As I mentioned with the midterm, if you try to do it before you see my review lecture, you will have a better mark on the exam itself. As with the midterm in part A, I'm not going to give you the answers right now. Um, for two reasons. Number one is there are so many terms available to put in Part A, um, I'm not likely to repeat those. And secondly, you can look at them yourself, and then if you have any questions, you can email me. I do want to get on to Part B, Question 1. Um, I'll go through those very quickly. Again, I'm going to post the answers, um, but I thought I might provide some additional explanation as we go along. Uh, and the first question was all those... Um, items that you find on application forms that are prohibited by law and I asked you to list three in the class I think we went through at least four those four are sex of the applicant sex is irrelevant um, unless it actually is a bona fide job qualification going to the uh, uh, performance of the job itself a date of birth is uh, supposedly irrelevant Employers like to uh, sometimes find out the, the date of the birth of the person so that they can perhaps go with a, a younger applicant uh, and pay less or go with an older applicant to get uh, experience and, um, uh, and knowledge. <clears throat> but you cannot ask that. You cannot ask if there's a criminal record, um, as we discussed in class. Um, once a person has um, been caught convicted and served his or her time they are then considered to be an upstanding member of the community and their criminal record is not supposed to be a question asked um, if we did not employ anyone with a criminal record those people would have no option but to go out and commit further crimes to try to make a living um, and so obviously for public policy reasons you cannot ask it if the person does handle cash or valuable securities, you can ask if they are bondable, okay? If they're um, bondable, that means, uh, yes, they do not have a criminal record. If they're not bondable, that means they've been convicted for something. Um, uh, so, oh, great, well, why don't I just ask if they're bondable? Well, you can only ask if they're bondable in a situation where they actually handle cash or valuable securities, and you do get bonds on your employees, okay? If you just ask it to circumvent the criminal uh, record, then you leave yourself open to a uh, human rights violation. You cannot ask for the social insurance number. Oh, wait, wait, this makes so much sense. You'd ask for it now when you hire the person you already got it. No, no, no. You cannot ask it. Okay, that's private information. If you don't hire the person, you don't need it. So you can only get their SIN number after you hire them. All right, then uh, a second paragraph after that, uh, Harriet dug out the employment contract out of the file. A quick glance at her told the business was in trouble. There was no something outlining her duties, and there was no something indicating the education related experience the employee would have to have to be qualified. Okay, obviously the duties are listed in the job description, and um, the education and work related experience is in job specifications. You put those into the employment contract because that way if they do not have the expertise they say they have, then they have been un untruthful in their application and you have uh, misconduct reasons for letting them go. Um, and you put in the job descriptions because you want them, you don't want them to later say, hey, that's not, that's not one of my duties and then you get into this battle, right? Okay, a little later on, um, Grimes uh, refused, uh, uh, let's see, oh, uh, Gertson uh, had told him to go back to his previous job because he was a good worker. Uh, Grimes had refused. Um, okay, he was promoted and then demoted because of a lack of work. You cannot do that without giving uh, a notice or pay in lieu of notice because um, it's a... Uh, um, constructive dismissal, a, cha a unilateral change in the terms of employment. So under the Employment Standards Act, you would look to see how, gr how long Grimes has been with the firm. Um, and uh, uh, because he'd been there for eight years, under the Employment Standards Act, he's entitled to eight weeks notice. Or oh, wouldn't it be 11 weeks? No, because eight weeks is the maximum 
anyone's entitled to in accordance with the Employment Standards Act. However, the lawyer was claiming pursuant to the common law, Grimes was entitled to something more than the statutory minimum. The um, next paragraph talks about uh, <clears throat> the things you look at when you are letting an employee go uh, in order to determine the right amount of notice or pay in lieu of. Um, so it's the length of employment, the character of employment, the age of the employee, education or training of the employee, experience of the employee, and the availability of similar um, employment out there. You have to do that because of the um, uh, Prince versus uh, City of uh, Prince George case, um, or sorry, Byers versus the City of Prince George case. Um, okay, um, the important thing to remember from the uh, Bardell case is that the judge listed those six items, but that was back in like 1970-something, or 68 or something. Um, and in that judgment, the judge said this list is not necessarily exhaustive. There might be other things out there that uh, that come into play. And obviously that's the uh, Lazarowitz case and the Wallace cases that we discussed. Okay, um... Gertsen says, but our corporate lawyer said something about then deciding if the employee should receive the minimum or maximum amount of notice. What does he mean? The minimum is set out in the Employment Standards Acts. The maximum is, is decided by common law. Uh, then there was the uh, human rights uh, situation and um, uh, Harriet thought, oh yeah, that would be a complaint pursuant to the Human Rights Code. Okay. And then I just said list uh, five... Um, of the uh, prohibited questions you can ask during a uh, job interview. Race, color, ancestry, and place of origin. That, oh my gosh, there's four right there. No, that's one, all right? Uh, political belief, religion, marital status, and family status. Oh, there's two more. No, that's one, okay? Physical or mental disability. Ah, there's two. No, that's one, okay? Sex, sexual orientation, age, criminal, or summary convictions. Um, all right. Uh, question, uh, let's see, what I want to talk about, no, I think if I just give you the answer guide, you should be able to take care of the rest of those. I do want to get into the problem, part C. Um, okay, Myron and Mildred, um, uh, they come up with a clap hand, which is a gadget. Um, it's a, a promo item, and it's going to be uh, uh, sold, um, but they want to protect the intellectual property in it. Um, so uh, the clap hand, well, that's um, a name, but that's something you can protect with a trademark. Uh, be, or because it's a trademark. So there's two ways, okay? And every year people put down one, all right? Just for crying out loud, if there's question or answer one and there's two blanks, it's got to be the trademark one, okay? I mean, people put, oh, uh, the trademark is in, in, in I and then, uh, gosh, um, patent in two, you know? No, okay? There's two ways to protect a trademark. And I find it very frustrating that you don't listen. The first is you can sue for passing off as long as you are using the trademark name in a trademark sense. The other thing you can do is register the trademark under the Trademark Act. Okay, now it's an invention, has utility, ingenuity, and it's uh, uh, utility, ingenuity, and uh, <laughs> I forgot the third. There's three of them. Um, as long as those are there, then you can file for a patent, okay, on the invention. Now, there's a shape to it, so automatically it's an industrial design. But don't forget, there's other things. There's copyright, and then there's, um, if, if it's something that you have to expose to the public uh, or uh, part of the public in advance of getting it prepared, then you want to get a uh, non-disclosure agreement signed by those people. All right, Myron and Mildred uh, knew little about business. So while they're at the firm, um, they, uh, <clears throat> they wanted to talk to a lawyer to uh, find out uh, something about incorporating a company. Um, she suggested the best option was to form a corporation because it offered some advantages. Those are listed on slides 176 and 178. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not even going to go through those. Um, 
but that's the unlimited liability continued existence things all right and it was just like the idea because they had a young son mortimer who despite being 17 years old was interested in business and was excited about the prospects of becoming an officer and a director of the parent company what's the problem here the knee-jerk reaction is to say oh he's a minor therefore he cannot sign contracts that has nothing to do with this okay the fact that he's 17 the director and officer has to be 18 years of age or over pursuant to section 124 of the BC Business Corporations Act, which you'll have at your disposal and can look at during the exam. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Soon after the incorporation documents were sent off to Victoria for filing, the name of the company would be the Clap Hat Manufacturing Corp. Uh, the, con uh, the constituting documents provided for only Myron and Mortimer, but not Mildred, to be shareholders and directors. Limite said that doing it that way meant that Myron could also protect their personal assets because of the unlimited liability of a corporation, right? No, no. Um, what did the lawyer have in mind? Myron could transfer all his ownership of assets in the family, um, house, car, cottage, sh sailboat, shares, whatever, to Mildred. She's not involved in the corporation, so if they pierce the corporation veil and manage to go after Myron, Myron would be judgment proof, okay? <clears throat> he has a beneficial interest in those assets, which means he gets to use them and enjoy them, and in the event there's a marital breakup, he will get his fair share of those. But during the time that they're happily married um, and the corporate veil is pierced, um, he has only a beneficial interest and a creditor can only go after the legal interest in those things. Okay, what sort of insurance should the company get? A lot of problems here last term. Um, there, there is Myron, who is a director, and there's Knockley, who is a um, uh, president and operating officer of the company. Uh, he's the key person, okay? And so obviously Knockley needs key person insurance. Uh, Myron is on the board of directors and um, has no actual day-to-day -day operation. So if Knockley did something wrong and it was something that Myron might be in trouble for, um, you want to get heirs and admission insurance, which protects Myron as a uh, director. Um, then we got into the uh, signature lines and, you know, uh, this is one of those things I find incredibly frustrating. Um, I talk at the opening lecture about signature lines. We go through contracts. I talk about signature lines and seals. Uh, we have the quiz uh, based on, our, and pardon me, the um, uh, contract assignment. And I say, hey, everybody put in the signature lines correctly. Nobody does. Uh, so I put it on the quiz. Everybody, a lot of people get it wrong. So I think, hey, guys, that's it. By now, after like four whacks on the side of the head, uh, I'm telling you it should be on the final. And then on the final, people get it wrong. Like, <laughs> it's not that hard, okay? So, um, the bank wants to make sure that these people are on the hook. Uh, so the bank would want Clap Hat Manufacturing Court per authorized signatory. That way the, the corporation is on the hook for the bank loan. Now, Myron Entwistle is judgment-proof. But the bank doesn't necessarily know that. So the bank says, okay, we want Myron on the hook. So they have a line for him to sign with a red seal beside it. That seal means he's bound even in the absence of consideration. They ask for a, um, a balance sheet, of asset and, and liability statement from uh, people involved in the corporation. Myron would give them one and it would have zero on there because he has no assets. And they go, wait, everything's in Mildred's name. We want Mildred to sign a, um, a guarantee. And so she has to sign uh, with the red seal beside her name. And it's even more important to have the seal beside her name because she's not even involved in the corporation. Um, another thing that the banks would really, really want, which was not on last year's exam, which is a hint that it might be on this year's exam, is they would want Mildred to go out and get independent legal advice so that afterwards she can't say, oh my gosh, I didn't understand that if the corporation didn't pay, I would have to, all right? Okay, then they found premises, uh, and although Notley did not like one of the clauses in the lease, which is shown here, um, he didn't know what to do about it, okay? 
Um, the landlord reserves the right to request that the tenant vacate the premises at its own expense for a period of up to six months if the landlord is compelled to do so for reasons beyond the landlord's control. Okay, um, so this is the situation I said where the Marine Building in Vancouver had as asbestos insulation. One of my clients moved in there, signed a lease, didn't bother having us look at it. And, um, uh, and then... Uh, the landlord came and said, all right, the city passed an ordinance, no um, asbestos. That's something outside our control that was unexpected. You have to move out for up to six months while we rip the walls out and get the asbestos out and put in proper insulation. And the tenant said, but who pays for that? And the landlord said, well, you do. Um, and then the, the, uh, the, <clears throat> the tenant, my client, came in and was talking to me. And he said, um, and I said, well, why didn't you have us look at the lease? And he said, oh, man, he says, it was a standard form lease, like a, a standard form lease, eh? I mean, it's either standard or it isn't. And if it's a standard form lease, then that must mean the government prepares the lease and protects me, right? No, you're on your own. The standard form lease means it's the landlord's standard form, and he doesn't want to make any changes to it, so they tell you it's a standard form lease. Um, anyway, he said, had I come in, would uh, would you have recommended to take that clause out? And I said, well, I would recommend it, but the landlord won't do it because the exact thing that the, protects the landlord is what happened. And he said, then why should I pay you to look at it? And the next words out of my mouth was, in answering the next line, what insurance should he have gotten in order to protect himself from this clause? And that's business interruption insurance because through no fault of uh, clap hat manufacturing, um, their business is interrupted for a period of time and the insurance would have paid uh, any loss. Uh, next, Knockley and Myron went over the, uh, over the premises and the two of them proudly put up a big sign which read, Clap Hat Manufacturing. What is wrong with the sign? I get all sorts of answers like, oh, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not big enough or, or, you know, it isn't prominent enough or they didn't have permission to put it up. And pff, it is, there is no corp there. Section 27 of the BC Business Corporation Act, which you are entitled to bring into the exam, uh, obviously, because it's open book, I keep forgetting, um, says that the business has to display its full corporate name, okay, on buildings, um, on letterhead, on business cards, on invoices, on emails. Um, if you do not... Uh, put your full corporate name down there. Clap Hat Manufacturing suggests that this is a partnership. Somebody sues the businesses, business and doesn't know it's a corporation. They may, probably would be successful in going after uh, Myron. Uh, personally, because um, uh, it's either a partnership of Myron and Knockley or it's a uh, sole proprietorship, right? Okay. What else have we got here? Uh, okay, um, uh, he hired unskilled plant workers, which is easy because of the one-for-all and all-for-one assembly line Solidarity Plant Workers of Canada Union. There is no such union, but I just thought that, you know, they always come up with the initials, like um, uh, the um, Teamsters or something, so O-F-A and A-F-O-A-L-S-P-W. <laughs> I thought it was fun, uh, but then that's me. Um he signed the collective agreement on behalf of the company, which he's entitled to do. So what is a collective agreement? It's nothing other than a contract of employment between the corporation and all the union workers. Okay, In a, a master and servant relationship, the corporation has an individual client or a contract with each one of its workers. But under a union, you have a collective agreement. Okay. Um, okay, however, uh, finding a plant manager was more, a more difficult task. Um, he, found, he put a, an ad in the paper and forgot to put in a job description or job specification. As a consequence, he got way too many um, applications, um, but eventually he found and met with uh, Lentil Goldblum Steenberg, um, obviously um, an intention to suggest that this person is of the Jewish faith, all right, because I had to set up a human rights situation. Leonard spent the last 17 years as a plant supervisor and then production manager at a clothing manufacturing firm, so he's got the background expertise. He was interested in a new challenge and enticed by the $125,000 a year salary. Um, <clears throat> since uh, he was worried about giving up his secure job, Hadley said, don't worry, 
we've got such a great product, this corporation will last for years. Uh, Knockley's statement might cause a problem for him if the business fails. How? I got all sorts of really bizarre answers here. Uh, you know, oh, like he'll be out of work and he won't be able to make his mortgage payments. And I'm going like, where is that? What I'm talking about here is the um, Lazarowitz versus Orenda engine case where a business enticed uh, Lazarowitz away from a very, very substantial job where he had long-term history um, and said it's, you know, you're you're going to become the CEO and president of this company and it'll be the pinnacle of your career and uh, you'll make a great salary. And uh, Lazarowitz said, yeah, but what happens if it doesn't go? And they said, oh, don't worry. And it's, it's guaranteed to be a success. That is a negligent misrepresentation, okay? The um, promoters for Lazarowitz engines were held to be liable uh, or, uh, <clears throat> you know, for the negligent misrepresentation. So the fact that the corporation had no money didn't matter. The promoters had uh, blown up their shares, so they had lots of money. And the court, the Supreme Court of Canada, said, okay, you not only look at how long he's been with uh, Clap Hat Manufacturing Corp., but you look at how long, how many years he had at the previous job, which is 17. So he, so uh, uh, Lentil would be um, entitled to uh, probably 17 months pay in lieu of notice, plus uh, perhaps something like a month uh, with this operation. So you'd probably get 18 months pay in lieu of notice uh, instead of you know less than a month. Okay, um, all right. Um, Oh, Knockley then asked some questions. He and I, there's a problem with my wording here, so don't really worry about it. But uh, he asked, "What's the educational your educational background? Uh, is there a problem with that question?" No, there isn't. Um, under the Human Rights Code, it is not one of the prohibited things you can ask about. Um, and then he said, um, uh, "Are you Jewish or something? Uh, we plan to operate 24/7, and I don't want any religious holidays interfering with plant production." And that's totally, totally wrong, okay? Um, uh, that's prohibited because you can't uh, question someone about their religion. Um, uh, how might that inappropriate question be asked to prevent the problem? You could say, um, as this operation is going to be at 7 and you will be required to work um, uh, shift work, uh, including holidays, or probably concluding weekends, is there any problem with that? Okay. Um, and then if Len says, oh, yeah, I'm uh, Jewish and I can't work on Saturdays, then uh, then he doesn't fit in and it becomes a bona fide job qualification that they, you know, they need a plant supervisor there. Um, uh, then you can uh, not hire the person. And uh, if you do get um, charged with an offense under the Human Rights Code, uh, you'll have a defense. Um, there was also something in there about his age, which I have somehow missed. Oh, yeah. Um, up there it says, but we're speaking about uh, of years. Um, how close are your retirement? We're looking for a long-term employee. Again, you cannot ask that. Age is totally irrelevant. All right. Um, but that was the one where I uh, missed putting in a line. So it doesn't really matter right now. Okay. Um, what statute deals with this? We've already mentioned the Human Rights Code. Okay, then uh, the incorpor incorporation goes through on June 28th. Uh, what is the problem with the date of the incorporation? And everybody put, there's no number, like 2020 there. Okay. Um, I guess I could have been clearer. Um, June 28th, 2020. What's the problem with that date? Okay. And the problem with that date is Knockley signed the lease earlier. That means the lease is a pre-incorporation contract. Um, under the uh, uh, BC Business Corporations Act, if you sign a pre-incorporation contract and the company does not ratify the lease after coming into existence, Knockley is going to be personally responsible for the payments. Okay, Or if the company doesn't come into existence and you've signed the pre-incorporation contract, you go back to the way the corporation signs. Clap Hat Manufacturing Corp. Well, take that off because it doesn't exist. 
take off per because you cannot be signing on behalf of something that does not exist and you cannot take a be, be an authorized signatory for something that does not exist that means all that's left is a line with your signature above it bingo you're personally liable okay michelle renee limite a partner with the right uh, pending limite law firm negligently omitted to tell myron and mildred how long it would take to incorporate the clapant manufacturing corp should the other partners in her firm be concerned about her negligence i was so obvious with this i couldn't believe that there were a lot of people that still didn't get it um, if a partner is negligent the other partners are jointly and severally liable for it okay and that's under Section 11 of the Partnership Act, I think. Or is it 13? I think Section 11 is joint liability. Section 13 is joint and several liability. Anyway, you've got that information in your materials, so you can check that out. What, what statute applies, obviously, it's the Partnership Act. Uh, then they have all the disasters. Um, and I'm not going to go through that, but uh, during the confusion, Linda Lightfingers, uh, one of the employees, began to steal the returned clap hands until she was caught and dismissed by Knockley. Dismissed for what? Theft? No. Okay, that's a crime. Okay, Dis dismissed for misconduct. Now, um, they've uh, now she's taken them and sold them, so she doesn't have them to return. Um, what what should the company do? Well, hopefully they have insurance. Theft insurance, of course. No, wrong. It's fidelity insurance. Okay, if a customer steals, you need theft insurance. If an employee steals, it's called defalcation, and you have to have fidelity insurance or that bond that I talked about earlier. Okay. All right, unfortunately, when Headley dismissed Lightfingers, she went to the shop steward because the assembly line workers belonged to the AFLW. Uh, when the head of the AFLW heard the news, uh, an immediate strike was ordered by the union president, Heidi Hoffa. Nobody gets that sort of joke. Um, Jim, Jimmy Hoffa was the head of the Teamsters for years until... Uh, he was arrested for tax evasion by uh, Robert F. Kennedy, who was the Attorney General of the United States, um, and he was jailed. When he got out, he um, went back, and they actually took him back as the President of the Union, and um, he uh, um, apparently absconded with Union funds or something and disappeared. Okay, So uh, Heidi Hoffa is um, his uh, niece. Okay. Uh, Heidi says, uh, such treatment of employees is unacceptable and it would be a matter for negotiation when our current collective agreement comes up for renewal next year. Um, okay, if the current collective agreement is going to come up next year, that means it must still be in force this year. So they have a contract. They have a collective agreement in place. Ergo, what is the problem with the strike? And people are put down, oh, they'll lose wages, oh, the company won't be able to make... All right. No. What's the problem with the strike? If you strike during a collective agreement, it's called a wildcat strike. The company can go to court and get an injunction to stop the union and also seek damages. Okay. What type of labor dispute is this? It's a contract dispute. Three types of labor disputes. There are certification disputes. There are collective bargaining disputes. Um, and there are... Um, uh, contract disputes. Okay, certification dispute occurs when uh, the, a union is trying to become certified as the union for a group of workers. A collective bargaining dispute is um, uh, when they're negotiating a collective agreement, and then once they have a collective agreement, um, it's a, it's just a contract. So it's a contract dispute. You could put down a collective agreement dispute. I would accept that. Um, uh, how is the dispute resolved? The grievance is taken to the Labor Relations Board. Um, okay. Um, uh, Headley goes back to Len and says, Okay, Len, we don't need you as a manager, but we don't want to let you go, so why don't we just put you as a supervisor on the assembly line at a reduced pay? Uh, what's the problem with the decision to demote, demote uh, Goldblum Steinberg? Uh, it amounts to constructive dismissal. Um, now Knockley wanted to terminate Ms. Del Cordera, the sales manager, but Headley was unsure how much pay in lieu of notice was required as Della 
had been with the firm for only seven months. What are the four factors? Uh, what are four factors? Uh, Hockley should Nockley should take into account in determining uh, the notice. And again, this is the uh, Bardell case, and it's on the exam twice because it's so important. Uh, the Bardell case, uh, see slide 135. Uh, you can give notice or pay in lieu of notice, um, uh, but you have to look at things like how long she's been there, what's her work background, is there other employment available, things like that, okay? Um, then uh, what dictates the minimum notice, what dictates the maximum notice, you had a choice of whether you answered it or not. And the other part, uh, or, no, I guess that was question one quite good. Oh, we got that twice. You, and boy, if you knew that, you get uh, two marks there. And if you knew it, you get two more marks here. Duplication. Oh, well, what the heck. Uh, the minimum is um, Employment Standards Act, and the maximum is uh, set out in the common law. Uh, anyway, with all the problems, the uh, corporation goes insolvent, and then the question becomes um, what creditors um, can... Uh, 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 who the creditors can go after. Um, uh, I sent the workers home, locked the doors, and dust off your resumes, you're all out of work. The employees demanded unpaid wages. Uh, who might the employees sue for the lost wages? Well, the company. Company, of course, because they have an employment agreement with the company. Um, and they can sue Knockley and Myron pursuant to the Employment Standards Act. Remember we talked about the Employment Standards Act, how there was a section in there that said the company... Um, or the persons responsible for paying um, are responsible for up to two months unpaid wages. Okay. Who might the suppliers sue for the unpaid invoices? Uh, the company. Okay. Uh, oh, can't they pierce the corporate veil and go after uh, Myron or, or Knockley? No. Okay. Simple as that. Uh, who might the bank sue? for the amounts of the outstanding loans. Well, obviously the company, because it's a breach of contract, but they can also sue Myron and Mildred on their personal guarantees. Uh, as Len locked up the premises and walked to the street to get in his car, uh, the miserable day brightened a little bit. He found a tote bag containing a laptop computer and some software. He looked around, but there was no one in sight. So he put the laptop uh, and the software in the trunk of his car and drove home humming finders, keepers, losers, weepers. Uh, what is the law with respect to the tote bag and contents? It's the law of finders. All right, the person that left it there did not leave it there for the purposes of transferring title to uh, Len, okay? Uh, so they are obviously an inadvertent bailor. Len, when he picks it up, he is an inadvertent bailey. Bailor, bailey, he has to return it in as good a condition or better um, because it's public property. Um, <clears throat> provided he could, he could find the, uh, the owner. Okay. And you should, I mean, uh, I'm not sure that there's any law that says you have to search for the owner. Okay. But I think it would, uh, there's an ethical duty on you to search for the owner. Uh, all right. And that was the, uh, the problem. There was, uh, over 40 marks available. So you didn't have to get everything correct in order to get the full 40 marks. Um, the, um, uh, the answers, uh, for the most part, were better than on the midterm exam. I guess a lot of people got a wake-up call in the midterm. Um, hopefully, you, you're not in that category this year. Um, now, um, I guess the thing to remember is uh, uh, question one in part B will unlikely be an employment situation. Okay, Because that was last year. Um, so what could it be? Well, it could be um, an insurance problem or it could be a partnership problem, um, or it could be a corporation problem, um, or it could be an intellectual property problem. So those are the other four possibilities for uh, Part B, Question 1. Uh, if you have any questions about any of this or in your studies, um, I will be available by email. And if you really want a face-to-face -face, uh, discussion, um, or if there's a group of you studying and you want to uh, do a face-to-face -face discussion and ask me questions, uh, then you email me and we'll set up a Teams time just for the uh, that particular group of people. Um, I do reserve the right, though, if you ask a question, to circulate my answer to that question to the other students and the assumption that uh, either they were too nervous to ask the question or they uh, would have asked it had they thought about it. And that's all on this video. Thank you very much.